I'm Philip Lullyveld. I work at the Entertainment Technology Center, and we're now going to do Q&A with the three prior panelists, plus Ted Shilowitz, the futurist from Paramount. And on this panel, um, I wanted to, if I can give it an overall theme, address the intersection of synthetic humans, personal identity, business, constructed reality, and real natural reality. So I just wanted to start with a quick question for Liam, which is on your slide of self-sovereign digital identity, you mentioned no one can impersonate your identity, stop you from using it or delete it. When you say no one can impersonate your identity, did you have thoughts on how to stop that? Yeah, um, the, so there's, uh, you know, the, the self-sovereign digital identity in a lot of ways is kind of a dream. It's like some, there's, there's some, it, it's, and it's, it's a technically heavy dream. Like it, it very much uh, means that there's, there's a whole uh, technical architecture that, that makes, makes those, th those things possible. Like you cannot be impersonated. Um, there's some prototypes out there like, uh, like Sovereign Hyperledger, which essentially says like, I'm going to have this, um, this uh, digital identifier that exists, uh, you know, on like a, Crypto ledger, possibly, you know, for instance, and uh, that I use that to sign the things I do in the digital world, and uh, I, I am the only one that can make this signature. So if you don't see this signature being uh, uh, the signature on my actions, uh, then it wasn't me, and and that this signature cannot be made by anybody but me, and that's that's really the hope that uh, of of that of that. Now the the ultimate extension is, is I don't have to sit there constantly like pulling out my, my phone and signing everything I do, but uh, that it, this is kind of happening naturally by the, by the technologies that I'm using. Uh, but, and I, I think there's a pathway there and I have a lot of thoughts on that, but that's kind of the general idea. Okay, great. Yeah. So on to um, synthetic humans. Uh, Pete, you wrote a really wonderful paper leading up to the Virtual Beings Conference last month on your learnings from creating Lucy. So for um, both you and Ryan, are there unique components to behavior that could be codified? Like we have letters for words and we have notes for music. Um, can, is there a structure to um, emotion or behavior, if you will? I think uh, we are looking at things from the past to, s to start to think about that, one being like Jungian archetype mm -hmm. as a first step into that. So, you know, I think I use lots of different examples, but does Mickey Mouse, you know, if you were to try and recreate Mickey Mouse in a way that was accurate to all of Mickey Mouse's experiences and personality types, how could you quantify that in a description language? And what would be that description language? Um, so that's how we're approaching it. Uh, you know, there's also sort of a Myers-Briggs approach. There's a cool website called um, 16 Personalities, which is kind of a streamlined Myers-Briggs. But one of the little features it has is you, you, know, you spend 20 minutes filling out this form and it gives you an archetype. But at the bottom, it gives you, here's all these famous people in history and fictional characters that are also like you. And to me, that's a tool because we can say, oh, if you're like Shakespeare and you're also like Sybil from Downton Abbey, I can make some inferences about how you're going to perform in a certain scenario, in a scene or in a moment, or how you're gonna to react to a stimulus just based on interpolation. Because that means it's less about this very narrow band of behavior and a much more sort of uh, combinatorial or comparative where I can say, well, Sybil did all these things, Shakespeare did all these things, and now I can make some judgments about how this character might interact in this particular case. So looking at some of these older tools is like guidelines for how we might build a system to describe a character. Well, let me open the question up to the whole panel because earlier today we had some people talking about rights and how you've got a right to your image and right to content. Do you have a right to your behavior is there a way of codifying that so you could claim it? Or is that just like the letters of the alphabet um, 
uh, general use. Especially if someone is paying you for that perceived behavior, right? So when you talk about, this is what we were talking about before. But it's behavior, it's not the image. Yeah, but if you're casting an actor in a piece of media and they bring some of their personality to the role, like, you know, use a very character-driven an Al Pacino or Richard Dreyfuss or someone that you would say, yes, we're giving them lines, but they are bringing their version of humanity plus their physical presence to the role. Yeah. Do they own any part of their humanity within that role, or is it owned by the entity that's paying them? It's, it's an open question. I don't have an answer for it. I just think it's an interesting area to go into deep discussion about the, as we talk about digital humans, what we're really talking about is digital representations of forms, right? And as the tools get more and more sophisticated and more and more powerful, so when we reflect back to the early days of cinema, we started with the idea of representations, analog celluloid representations of people that were captured, right? And they were often referred to as well, these are kind of like ghost captures. We're, we're taking part of their soul. There are certain cultures that still believe that if you photograph someone, you take part of their soul. And that's an interesting sort of story fodder in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Now think about, flash forward to here we are on the cusp of 2020, what we can do to digitally capture someone's soul and make a photorealistic version. I could, with a little bit of work, make a photorealistic version of Phil that I could fool a lot of people with hundreds of millions of people if I wanted to, right? Am I duplicating your essence in some way with a digital tool with these advanced displays and uh, head-mounted displays that we can put into the world and give mass access to? It opens up a really interesting ethical sort of discussion that probably started a little over 100 years ago with the first captured images using technology, originally chemical technology, now digital technology, to make a false version of somebody, right? So that sort of opens the conversation. I don't necessarily know if I have any answers to it, but you might, because you're starting to do it as a no, business. No, I mean, this is on. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, protecting your likeness as an image is, is easier to understand today, but protecting your likeness emotionally or as a behavior is harder to, harder to understand, I think, still. Um, and maybe it's about how closely you're looking with a magnifying glass. Um, we all communicate in similar ways. We all have the same tools to communicate, um, but we have different um, ways of expressing ourselves um, with varying degrees of specificity, right? Um, so I, I think it's just about, like, it's all relative to how close you're looking. And similar to image, the closer you get to pixels, the less you're seeing something that, you know, uh, you could qualify as being unique. If I'm zoomed in on a photo and I'm seeing just five pixels, I can say, oh, those are just five pixels of five colors. But if I'm zoomed out and I see a likeness, I can say, oh, that's my likeness. I think the same is true from behavior. Um, it just depends on how closely you're able to uh, look, if that makes sense. Well, when Johnny Depp did Keith Richards, as sure. uh, Captain Sparrow, yeah, um, was that a he violation? Steals a little bit of his essence to do that, yeah. right? I I would say it's it's hard to say. I mean, uh, <laughs> he's certainly borrowing part of it, but is it the whole complete Keith Richards? Keith Richards? No, not not. It's hard to say. I think it's really subjective today. Liam, I, I would say as as time marches forward, as the tech marches forward, all this these notions are really gonna fundamentally start to break down. Because if we go into, you know, our likeness comes from our genes, which was we all share. Our behavior comes from our, lear our, our learned behavior, our, me our memes, the ideas in our head, which we all share. And these, uh, you know, especially our behavior, it's very malleable and influenceable. And uh, so it's, I've done just so much in behavioral analysis and behavioral prediction and, and, and influence systems to, to just see that this is, uh, we're we're starting to, to uh, the the tech is going to break down the way is really going to break the way that we talk about all of this and that's I I always wonder like how how we're going to have capital you know how are we how are we going to have like uh, like ethical capitalism if we're if we're going to you know 
I just imagine a video game that's that's psychologically manipulating me to care about these characters, and then it hits me with a microtransaction, <laughs> you know, <laughs> right, right, at the, right at this really at this moment where it knows I'm emotionally vulnerable, and I'm, and now it can it can pump me for cash so I could it, to influence the story or buy an item that, you know, for this character I have meaningful empathy to, or a million other scenarios that are just. That, that are going to start coming from <laughs> from this. Or. It's already happening on Twitch. You can pe uh, tip people and in yeah. China to get uh, validation or a call out, right? Like mm -hmm. I yeah. think it's already happening. Or be paid yeah. to start behaving differently until yeah. it starts to influence your actual character. Or you know. yeah. Pete? I mean, I think with the ubiquity of these systems coming in, the fear dissipates. If you want a good example of this, go watch the Sandra Bullock movie, The Net. <laughs> because that was a snapshot of how we thought the internet would be. Yeah. And, you know, some of it was we didn't have experience, so we projected our fear. Some of it was, you know, what is now the Google campus uh, in Mountain View was SGI campus, but right next to that was VeriSign, and every key that was generated for the internet was in one building, and there were, like, probably five people making decisions about what was a secure website and what wasn't. But now that's a technology that's just you know embedded in how we transact every day. We have no qualms about buying something on the internet or sharing our data with someone that just has a little icon in a URL window. <laughs> so, you know, we rightly so are concerned about these things, but they are inevitable and our lack of understanding is typically sort of manifested as fear. My son's generation won't be concerned with these things, and they won't um, also be concerned with who knows things about him because he, like he does now in real life, there's thousands of other kids that he interacts with, and there's nothing that different about all of them. And so the idea that you would be targeted as a unique and vulnerable person for sharing this data is the same way we think about sharing our credit card information on the net right now, I think. You know, well, I, I just think it's just scary to us because we can't imagine this future yet. We're at an inflection point. Like we were, it was mentioned earlier today that SAG-AFTRA is looking into this issue as a possible revenue source, something that could be licensed. If you can't codify it, you can't, if you can't define it, you can't really license it. So. Um, I'm kind of asking, is this an opportunity to license it, or are they just like professional um, impersonators from 30 years ago? They'll certainly try to license it. I think the Hollywood system will try to harness it if they can, but I think that it's going to be a wild time. You know, It'll be in, in your negotiations with, well, don't say this. Um, <laughs> I can't ask that. But do you imagine a contract term that says, if I get a character to act exactly like the human, you're prohibited from putting that behavior in another character. It's possible. I mean, there's two things I've encountered already in 2019. Number one is um, with speech synthesis. Uh, so the idea of you know using sort of voice cloning or sort of tuning of a voice. Uh, so let's say we're working with like a celebrity um, and we have half an hour of their voice, but we have a baseline voice or many voices. Um, you know, uh, how do they get paid for their voice likeness? And also, they need to maintain control of what that voice says and have a creative and business control over how it's used. So those are things that are already, are already being discussed. Um, but I think like one thing we'll see change very soon is the notion of uh, voiceover acting and like with speech synthesis as it gets better, what will that mean for voice actors? Um, that's something that's coming. Um, but I think in general, um, identity is gonna be a huge issue um, for Hollywood lawyers very soon. Okay. Well, it's, it's being negotiated right now. Like if you had a talent agent up here on this panel, they would tell you that these are now one-off cases that will start to become kind of group precedent. characterized They cases. love precedent. Yeah, and they're gonna drive individual celebrities and personalities on a movie by movie, TV show by TV show, podcast by podcast basis to negotiate all of these rights and those rights will get deeper and deeper and more nuanced and more sophisticated depending on A, how much money the various entities have to negotiate 
like a lot of a young actor won't do it because they just don't have the resources to do it. They don't have a really smart attorney or talent agent that would say, you know, just so you know, you're in your 20s now and maybe by the time you're 50, you may be the biggest actor on the planet. You may want to maintain and control your digital likeness rights, your 3D asset rights, your creationist rights of what to ever technology can be created in ever whatever form in the future, what a legal form would say. Throughout That's the Yeah, throughout the universe. That's definitely happening now for, for all time. very known actors, yeah. probably more usury for people starring on YouTube, right? So that's kind of interesting to think okay. about. So um, in, in Liam's uh, product, you're basically gathering all information you possibly can about an individual. So now we're talking about not celebrities, but everybody. Yeah. And you're able to create a digital twin. Is that digital twin going to be able to be useful in predicting what I do? When do what would be needed for that to happen? So um, I'm the number one user of LifeScope. I have about 16 terabytes of data on myself in my personal database. And when I, I've run, I, I, like as we develop machine learning, it's pretty much all run on my data and one other person's data, because uh, we just have so much of it. And I can, I mean, these are off-the-shelf models. I can pretty much put all my location data in and say, give me where I'm going to be in the next 12 hours, and it'll bake a heat map on Google Maps. And it's about 90-something percent accurate, depending, depending on the day. I can ask, give me a differential histogram in the next 12 hours of what I'm going to do. It's about 80 to 90 percent accurate. I can uh, follow a conversation where someone sends me a message, and then it uses GDP2 and actually gives me a response of what I'm going to say next, and it, it knows may, it more often than not knows the topic or whether or not I'm going to answer a question. It's going to, at what point, 98, 99, 99.9% .9 accuracy, does it start to really imbue me? And I can do weird things as well. I can also make a cam chimera. I can take multiple LifeScope databases and say, I want to make a, the, 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 the zeitgeist of all males over 30 in Western America. Boom, there, mm -hmm. there's the, the chimera of them. Or, um, so I, I kind of wonder with this database, like, could I ever reasonably give full, full or most access to my boss without losing my own autonomy? Could I sell my data without it becoming like some weird mind control like targeted right back at me through ad tech or something even worse. Like this is a, this, this is a, a real, I, as I said in the start of my talk, everything I've done on LifeScope proves to me that free will, that we have no free will. We are completely predictable. We are completely manipulatable. We're playing with fire here. And uh, we gotta take, you gotta defend this to the last draw. That's why I think that like, Surveillance capitalism needs to stop right where it's at and actually go way back from where it is right now because the machine learning is just way too powerful to be for society to deal with, in my opinion. It should not be applied to these problems. So. Well, what you're referring to is interesting and very apropos of where we're sitting right now. And I presume some of you must know this. A lot of times when I tell it, I'm the only one that knows this in an audience, mm -hmm. but I've got to imagine in this audience some people know this. You can... Google, hey Google, I want my data. Yeah. And they and you can find a website, a number of them, that will give you a link and you can write a note to Google saying, I want everything I've ever done on your search engine. If I have a Gmail account, if I've ever searched on Google, and they will actually send you, they have it in their their guides and ethics of the company. Google takeout. Yeah. Google takeout. Yeah. Take out Google. And they will either send you a zip file on your email that you can download, or if it's big enough, they will send you a note saying, you've been using this for so long, this zip file will be tremendous and you probably won't be able to download it for a very small nominal fee, we'll send you a hard drive of all of your stuff. And you can literally see every single thing, your digital footprint, kind of the same business that you're building, Google has that as an underpinnings, and they will give it to you if you ask them, so, which so, is interesting. So as a, um, as a fallout of the GDPR regulations and the billions of, of fines against Facebook, the uh, data transfer project was born as of this alliance between Facebook, Google, Apple, Twitter, uh, Microsoft, and it's uh, this bastard team that uh, is is like bastardized team is that's supposed to allow it's it, they're supposed they're forced by the EU to actually put up this tool they were supposed to already pu publish it mm -hmm. where you could go to data transfer 
Microsoft.org, sign into Microsoft and then sign into Google and say, I don't want to use Google Drive anymore. I should be able to transfer it to OneDrive. I don't want to use OneDrive anymore. I want to transfer it to iCloud. Now, the, the data transfer project right now is supposed to be like this cabal of, of big tech companies that are they're just like, well, we're going to be the mob, and uh, you can go from one of the big guys, but it's not like you can actually take this stuff home and use do anything of it. And we've kind of come in sort of like the, the demon that they summoned and been like, no, we're actually going to give people an option to... to, to um, to, to sign off from Silicon Valley and, and take this information home with them permanently and never be seen again. And uh, it's, it's going to be interesting next 12 months as we fight this out. And, and we're not alone. There's a lot of people like Tim Berners-Lee who's, who's doing a lot of great work on this. But stand well, up for the fight. Let me bring uh, Brian and Pete into this. Because if you create a really good virtual character like Lucy, but I don't want to single Lucy out, um, I want them around me. And I will tell them anything they ask me. So when you talk about surveillance capitalism, how does, does that play into your personal friend who is also the personal friend of a billion other people on the planet? Yeah, I think you'll have to decide who tells you those stories. You know, If you're going to hear the stories that we're telling, we have really no interest in that conversation that you're having with Lucy. Mm -hmm. We just hope that you're enjoying that conversation with Lucy. So it's very similar to what you're talking about, which is if you are willing to have this conversation, we want that to be reciprocal and self-contained. And ideally, at your house, I could care less about storing that data. I could care less about mining that data. Well, how, will, how would you message that? Well, the irony is with GDPR and CCPA, you do have to store data tagged to someone's identity so that they have the right to identify it and delete it. Otherwise, maybe folks like us would only really care to have that data to improve the accuracy of our algorithms. But that's not something we're allowed to do. Um, you know, if we want to be compliant, we need to be able to allow the user to uh, remove their data. But I think that the simple choice is looking at the mistakes of uh, tech companies uh, past and thinking about uh, targeted ad businesses and selling third-party data to other folks. And those things are usually where problems start. So I think in the case of our company, those are two businesses we're not interested in for various reasons, those being some of them. In terms of like having the conversation about it with the audience, um, I went to the Immersive Design Summit, uh, which is it's just this mind-blowing conference of Nordic LARPers and just like like just stuff that you don't know exists in the world, but it's so, so cool. Um, and one of the things that I was fascinated by was the fact that um, you know this Nordic LARPer was saying, you know, you're responsible for the entire experience, not the moment that they're, they're engaged in your experience, but the moment they are aware of the service, the time they buy a ticket, the transportation to the event, the first moment they show up, the experience itself. Some of these are like highly traumatic. You know, we're talking about uh, simulating a waterboarding so you can feel like what it would be like to be uh, tortured. Mm -hmm. So you're also responsible for the offboarding. Mm -hmm. And so if we were to approach it from, from Fable's perspective of this conversation about trust, it would be Lucy having a conversation with you about it. You know, okay. we're meeting for the first time. You know, this is going to be a conversation. I'm going to remember what you say to me, and I'm going to keep it private, you know, unless you don't want me and unless you want me to share it. So I think it, we use that sort of methodology to, to encourage the trust. And it's, it's a two-way relationship the way we see it. Brilliant. Um, I have a thousand questions and I didn't open it up, but we've got to end because it's five o'clock. So please join me in thanking the panel.